to show you what our campus looks like. And then talk through, um, we actually broke it down into five parcels that our campus is combined and constructed of from the original parcel and then the added on pieces that we either acquired and in fact in one case we were given um, to make up the, the campus as a whole. Um, I'm not going to, there's, there's like six or seven more slides that have text on them. I'm not going to read through them. I'm just going to kind of do that as a narrative for the first couple of slides. And then we're going to slide down and have some discussions on um, other sites, the current sites, other sites, and some of the options that fit uh, the parameters that are set by whether it be zoning or the educational program um, or just actual access and space. Just to kind of start out, give you an idea, we'll look at the, the zoning criteria. And as I said, this, this dotted line is kind of what we currently own, and it kind of shows you what, what the, the zoning requirements are. So R2 is all of our existence here. So this is the acquired property that we got uh, a couple of years ago from the Lehman Farm. So this actually was the entire Lehman Farm. We sold this piece off to a developer. We uh, were gifted this 10 acre by Mr. Lehman and acquired this remaining 12 acres. And then this piece in the back was bought by the then Dodge dealership for them to acquire uh, and put a recondition center on. This piece is an R1, a residential one. So this is R2, which is more dense development. This is more you know, single family housing development. So if you think about townhouses and things of that sort here, and single family dwellings here. This property was acquired from uh, Brethren Church. Uh, they were looking to sell the property. At some point in time, they originally thought they were going to put a church on it. And when we heard that, we felt that it was a good acquisition to acquire some access on the Ridge Valley Road and actually for future development. This small piece over here um, was also another property that was given to us on a 99-year lease to help Waterford Square, which is in this commercial two area, to develop theirs. And this is their green space. So this is non-developable. We'll go over that. It, currently has a rudimentary uh, baseball, GME baseball field, and that's actually where our practice football field is. That, that kind of gives you the parameters, and we'll start referring to some of these zoning things as we go through. Mike, what about, what about at the top? Does that include the, oh, that does include that's the That's something you the large parcel that okay. was, was originally And the, the one we got from the church, how many acres is that? It's roughly 20, almost 20 acres, 19.67 or something. Okay. And I'll give you those as we go through. So this um, just kind of illustrates, again, from an aerial viewpoint, what the district owns. And in the red, talks about what we perceive as land that's not developable due to some sort of restrictions. Okay? It's a little difficult to see, but they're outlined in, in the purple. And then they're broken out by other smaller pieces that you can see. What percentage is that? Do you know what percentage the part that we can't melt the red is of our? I don't have an exact amount. I can find that. Part. But I think we'll start on, on parcel one, which is this very large parcel right here. Um, obviously, Eagle View Middle School sits here, Silver Spring sits here, and the high school sits here. Our district support facility and our administrative offices are here. So. Just kind of working through it. The area is about 133.41 acres in that parcel. It's zoned residential two. And a public school is considered a permitted use. So it's not special exception or something like that that we've talked about before. Um, it could be used to renovate, put additions to, replacement of our, or repurpose of Eagle View and Silver Spring building, and renovations or additions to the high school. Development limitations kind of run our steep slopes. So one of those uh, steep slopes are in the back end of this building. Um, the steep slopes are really pretty pronounced in here. Another steep slope area is here where we actually uh, try to do, use a creative reuse of that where the solar panels are. Um, and setbacks and limitations in some in this area. So in other words, the requirements related to zoning for the surrounding properties and how far you can set the building back is a limitation here. If you would to take away the football field, you would be able to have some better use of that facility there. So we believe that is a developable piece of property. Um, we believe this small slice.
place of the developed piece of property, but for the main campus, the majority of it has pretty much been developed out. Um, and as I said before, this small piece is non-developable because it acts as green space for our agreement with water for the square over here. So Mike, it's a little hard to see, but I want you to point out a couple of things. First of all, the lower right-hand corner, what we call the rugby area. That's actually a stormwater detention facility that right. we have put a, a rugby field on. Yes. But that is that, that, that is not built on. That is not built. Okay, now shift to shift to the left. And I'm sorry, right there, that, that piece, same thing. That's even though we don't have anything right on this piece. Again, that's a little bit more pronounced. That's a stormwater management area you can't build there. Right. Move more to the okay, where the baseball diamonds are and the tennis courts. That's also used for stormwater management. Correct. Plus we have our existing athletic facilities on those. And we have, and of course, our football stadium. Now to the left of that, the piece that you mentioned is a 99 year lease. We actually own that, right? But we've leased that to Waterford Square for them to use. I assume you're so they own it at least the They own it and they leased it to us. Correct. Okay, so we don't have full ownership rights of that property. All right, and then coming up around we have the Sulphur Farm area, right. and then to the east of that, you have the area that sits um, below Eagle View. That is, it's pretty nasty slopes in there. There's a pond, and there's a pond, right? Um, and then if you go to the back left, the area up there. How big is that piece right there? It's probably around and close to uh, 15 to 18 acres. Uh, pretty heavily sloped on this back side. And there's also, just, just to give you a, a, another thing, Texas, uh, there's a Texas pipeline, liquefied uh, uh, natural gas, that goes through this entire area here. So they have an easement on our property to have a, a gas line across the Okay. Area. So the areas that really are left that have not already been developed would include the area immediately behind and on either side of Eagle View where we will be talking about putting wings. Oh, right here. Yeah, there, and then, and then of course, the parcel up on Mirage Valley, and then this, okay. I just, I just kind of wanted to go back and point some of those. What, what, I, I, I know where the rugby fields are. Do we have anything on these other two parcels? To the, next Here? to the, yeah, those? No, we're going to talk about those. Yes. Okay. We're going to talk about those. Okay. So then, parcel tools, as I said, Mike. Excuse me, that the field behind the uh, Silver Spring football field. Yes. What are we using that for now? They use it for uh, soccer. They also use it for the PE classes that use it for the track. So they use the turf facility as well as the grass facility. You'll see soccer, you'll see the cross, um, you'll see the band up there. So there is a number of uses that it does. More than practice. More than practice than actual games or competitions. Right. That area there, in conjunction with Silver Spring, what's the approximate acreage? I would guess yes. the end, you're probably in the 10 to 15. Although in this area right here, it's extremely steep slope. So it's the seed that the back of the building currently right here, it kind of goes into a hillside. And then we created a stairway to create an upper playground that the kids can get in. And then a, a, an ADA or an handicap accessible pathway. So there's not, you're saying, I mean, let me hear that again. That field plus existing Silver Spring parking area, that whole area there, uh, between uh, the, the, the hillside and the wooded area in the back is not developed. This piece, again, is a standalone piece, most likely not. This piece, you could potentially put a, a building on here. And again, it probably gets down to size and stormwater management. So, I'm just, it's a good segue that I can kind of lead into. As Bob said, these stormwater detention ponds are deep detention ponds. In other words, the philosophy when the campus was developed in 2000 was to hold water, and it was called meadow development. So, you would hold the water just like it was a meadow if it rained, and then you let it meter out of your outflow pipes. So, the outflow pipes are choked at these ends, at these pieces right here. So, it'd be something I'm going to make up. Or you might really want to have like a 24 or 36 inch pipe, it's 18. And so 
So the bond are designed to fill up, and then over a course of you know 24 hours, 48 hours, decide to just slowly you know, reduce the, the, the storm water, and it settles the mud and the runoff, and it kind of lays in the bottom of the pan. So they're actually clay lined ponds. Currently, you'll see the design of that winding creek changing it changes as a result of the uh, Chesapeake Water Bay Act is to infiltrate water. So you may have heard of uh, impervious or impervious paving is a, is, a, is a methodology where you actually have paving that the water can go through big uh, storage bins of, of stone and or multiple shallow ponds. And those are designed to let the water infiltrate into the into the soil, back into the aquifer, but in a fairly over a larger period or excuse me, a larger amount of ground over a faster way. So part of that strength to this is these will, these will act as they act currently, but then you'll have to meet the current regulations as you start to develop. So these were designed to allow us to develop more densely by creating big deep holes. And as you see at Winding Creek and the Mountain View, it's a lot more land to spread those attention ponds throughout the entire campus. So uh, as we talked about parcel two, that we believe is definitely non-developable. In parcel three, which is at the top of the hill, it's right here, it's 19.67 uh, acres. It's an R1 property, so it means a residential uh, development. Public schools can, here is considered a special use exception. So you would have to go through the zoning and the land development plan process to allow a school to be built here. here. Uh, special exceptions are administered by the zoning here board, excuse me. Criteria for a school within Silver Spring Township includes the following. All height, area, setback, and coverage standards within the underlying zoning shall apply. So as a residential development, that's the zoning that you have to, uh, to, to use. All off-street parking lots are set back 25 feet and screened from adjoining parking lines. And outdoor play areas provide at a rate of 65 square feet per individual enrolled. Okay. Off-street parking lots are not to be used as outdoor play areas. Outdoor play areas cannot be located within the front yard. It must be 25 feet from all property lines. Outdoor play areas shall be completely enclosed by a four-foot minimum fence. So again, a little bit more restricted. Excuse me. And that's what I was referring to earlier, but it's not just how you use the facilities compared to 20 years ago, but also what is taken out of the space around. It's the external factors that are pushed on us by the township. township because we can't just build a school the way we want to build a school. We have to follow the township requirements. And in the past 20 years, Silver Spring Township, along with a lot of other townships, not so much Hampton, but have become a lot more restrictive with what you can build, where you can build it. And they all want more land to build the same building. So, you know, the, what, what looks like a parcel that is big enough for a school building or a school facility was 20 years ago, it's not anymore. And those regulations are out of our control. And in the case of Silver Spring Township, you have a township that, when it comes to something like a zoning variance, they've sued their own zoning hearing board over the fact that the zoning hearing board is granting variances. So, you know, the municipality, our home municipality, has not shown any interest in giving us any kind of flexibility to go beyond what their requirements are. So, we really are held to what those standards are. And in some cases, they can't because they're you know, regionally within the Chesapeake Bay drainage basin. And that's another thing. No matter what township you're in, they're, they're held to the different standards that state federal are. requirements for stormwater in the past 20, 20 years have gotten tremendously tighter. As you mentioned, you know, you basically need more land to build the same types of facilities. So all these things have kind of, you know, driven us to a point where, you know, it looks like you have enough land to do what you want to do with it, but in reality, because of all these changes, we don't. So, I have a question for follow-up. So, so that was my question. So it's an R1. Would it at all be able to be rezoned, or would it need to be? I mean, do you think that would help us? That's a political decision of the township. Okay. And and but that's also limited by the fact that you have to rezone it to something correct that is that, 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 that 
adjoining property is zoned. So right. could, would they zone it R2? They could. That, that's what so. Yeah. Would they? So the other Who question knows? is, is just to give everybody a kind of concept. So that's 20 acres, and we wanted to build on the west side, the school size that we need to for Winding Creek like we do on the east. When you take into effect the building, the parking, and all of those provisions, what is that right now covering just that space existing at Winding Creek? How many acres? How many acres? Again, probably on that that side, the site itself where the building sits is probably in the 25 acre. And then there's a pond and then there's another uh, area that is it's developable. But and that, that that we'll show you a diagram shortly that oh, okay. you get really at what you ultimately want to see. Oh. So back to this piece of property, I think the other thing that has changed dramatically, if you look at Sporting Hill or even uh, Shawl, the, they now require passenger drop off and pickup areas shall be provided to arrange that students don't cross traffic. So you see at Winding Creek, we have a separate bus loop and a separate parent parking loop. So that's now a requirement. So that's not, a, it's not something that you can, Is you can the appeal. State? The state no, that's, the, that's the state. Yeah. Send Cinder work. So that, so that drives some of the design of, of the property. That's so, good practice. So that is good practice. Yeah, yeah, but like the drawing that we had done back in 2013, or even earlier than that, by Dirk and Edson, that would... That wasn't a requirement at that time. No, I only see one loop. Okay. So they, and that's the other thing to keep in mind, as, as townships go through whatever iteration, they're redoing their zoning, they're redoing their, their land development practices, and they do that on, a, on an ongoing basis. And it may be driven by uh, some sort of a state, you know, that's what they're talking about statewide, or it might be driven by something that they perceive as a need. Okay. So this, this property up here, we believe, has development opportunities to include a new, smaller elementary school, as the Shaw Mall. Um, however, we do not believe that there's a capability of having access off of Ridge Valley. Um, unless there is some major reconstruction of that roadway um, by eliminating a high point on the road so that there is a valuable, uh, or excuse me, uh, ability to have the required sight lines by PennDOT. So this is a PennDOT road, we can keep that in mind also, it's not a municipal road. Um, but that would be that would be similar to what we had to do on Valley High with the road, when we had to change the sight lines, or no? We, uh, we actually replaced Valley High right. in total. Okay. So in this case, more in line with what we had talked about at um, Landscap, and we ended up putting a round line in there. So that was kind of the compromise. So I guess the point is there's some major re rework of this road if you want to use it as an access. Right. And we have an access, another access drawing to show you as kind of an aside to this conversation. So uh, again, talking by special exception, Mountain View prototype will not fit on this property. Winding Creek prototype, given the way it is, will not fit on this property. And uh, space and setback limitations are pretty tight here. Stormwater management areas associated with any proposed development. So you're saying the only model that would fit on there is Shaw? And, and even that would be tight. So you're talking about a 700 student building, basically the capacity that and you're roughly you're not adding, I think, at the end of the day, the amount of students, given the philosophy that we currently have. Yeah, if you look at that as an RMI, the cost per square foot for a smaller building like that, with what you have to do for road improvements and everything else, and um, site work, and it just, it, it's, to me, it wouldn't be feasible. Well, the, the difference between the existing silver spring to go to Shaw is less than 100 seats. Why is that? It's not even Separate, you have to add additional sources. 
if we would, let's, let's, let's get through the rest of the slides and show the foot, because we actually have footprints yeah. that we can show, and then let's circle back to this discussion, because that's, this is, that's the discussion we need to have today. So parcel three and four, as I said, this was donated by Mr. Lehman, so it's roughly around uh, 10 acres, 12 acres. Uh, the Eagle Foundation constructed these three soccer fields as a way to get some additional athletic space, and then this piece has been something that we've formed as well as this for the last couple of years. Um, it is in total 23.4 acres, uh, zoned for residential two, so very similar to the Simmons Court where you see all the townhouses going up. Uh, a public school in this is considered permitted use instead of special exception. Uh, school would face, we believe the school should face Rich Valley Way, excuse me, Rich Valley Road to keep the new traffic separate from the main campus. We think that would be a challenge. And a new quarter drive from Rich Valley to the main campus would help alleviate the traffic to the main entrance and they will make sure that. So overall, just some points about the educational park development limitations. The impervious surface coverage for the overall contiguous campus, and I think that's important. So originally this was considered you know, like one parcel, then these additional <coughs> three parcels. We have made a case when we did the, the expansion of the district office, even when we put this little uh, adding cage shed in a, a, a storage building down here that we have, have combined these properties with the total overall acreage to create a larger ability for uh, impervious or excuse me, for coverage uh, to the campus. So roughly the campus um, overall with contiguency is roughly 32% able uh, for, for impervious coverage. So let me just, so, so what you're saying is if you went on the total perimeter of the park, all of the parcels, if you compared the area that is pervious, which is buildings, parking lots, anything that doesn't allow stormwater to infiltrate, and you compare that to the overall campus site, 32% of the property is covered by something. So the development need to occur that it would not exceed 33 percent. That's kind of what we're we're regulated at right now. So we're so we're in terms of impervious cover, we're at our limit. Pretty much. Uh, the township would need to allow this impervious coverage analysis to be based on a comparison of the entire contiguous campus, the main campus plus the adjacent property. So as I said, this is 32 with these contiguous. Then you'd have to do a total rework to figure out how much. Just taking a little bit of a bird walk here. Um, now I'm going to just skip through these. Uh, 
Uh, and again, I wanted those to be there so that once we post it for the public, they'll be able to read it. Um, this is our basic design that we've been using for a number of years to put a connector road from Ridge Valley to the Educational Park. And then we put athletic spaces, but really, for me, it's the 10th grade overflow. It's the overflow for students that you have the capability of doing that. It would eliminate one of those soccer fields. The reason I, I show this is we don't believe there's ability to have the connector up here to the degree that you need. This seems to be a better route for our, our staff, students, and, and parents to use. Um, and we just want to, as you are working through the development of the campus, if this is a desire for either emergency egress and or some sort of uh, defined ingress and egress, it is a consideration to take place if you're going to build a building down. This is estimated is about a million dollars to make the connection between here and here. So then we're just going to look at site plans and talk about what potentials that we can do for those. Kind of is a, in an option format, but not necessarily recommendation, just kind of how we looked at this. So kind of keep in mind that there's just, just not one building and it's just not one concept. It's your elementary capacity, it's your middle school capacity, and then the desire to have some sort of a high school annex somewhere within the district. So those in my mind are kind of the three goals. How do you deal with uh, middle school enrollment? How do you potentially deal with uh, additional needs in elementary enrollment? And then how do you deal with the high school to try to get out students um, so that you're not having to put additions or create some sort of a new uh, uh, partial to the high school? So site plan one, we'll start with that. Um, I'm just going to go here first and then I'll back up. So as you see on Eagle View here are the little nubs. And we're going to show you a floor plan and I'll go through that. And then this is that shawl configuration with the current uh, shawl design, about 80,000 square foot building, which we then would you know, potentially put an athletic field in here. We show a connector road, but this most likely would end up as a right in, right out turn. So if you remember the shawl design on the words built, it's a pork chop. So you can just come in from the right and just leave from the right. So most likely the traffic, if you used your connector road, would come in here. They may have a middle school or an elementary school. They would drop, drop, and if they were going this way again, they would come back down to the bike. Um, but if you're going this way, you would have to come in, do your, do your business, and go back out to go over here to the right. Mike, just to be clear, the Shaw Elementary School is not the size of school, elementary school we need.